So you were saying how we can stop that from becoming a reality. Do you, do you think that that is on the horizon for places like where we are, the States, where you are in Germany? Yeah. In, um, so it, it is true that most Westerners, uh, when they hear of the Chinese social credit system, which is, by the way, at the moment being imported in other countries, in uh, South America, Middle America, and also Asian countries, both the software and the hardware. So most of us are repelled. But at the same time, we tend to give away our data for nothing, just to have free access to social media, to search machines and others. So we don't behave much different. We are not concerned what's being done with our data. This is what you call the privacy uh, yeah. paradox. Perhaps you could just elaborate on that. Okay, the, the privacy paradox means that uh, people are very concerned about where their digital data is going and who are the third parties and what they're doing with the data. But at the same, same time, are not willing to pay for their data. So, in, I've done a, a survey in Germany. Most, the, the biggest concern about digital life among Germans is that they don't know what's done with the data. At the same time, I've asked them if you could pay for, uh, all the social media so that uh, your data is no longer being given away to third parties, how much would we, you be willing to pay per month? So, Hannah, how much would you be willing? But I'm really, For all social media. <laughs> I'm really interested in this because I feel that it's my right <laughs> to have that privacy rather than something that uh, you yeah. pay for. But also you get a service from Google, from Facebook, from Instagram, and you have... You have a choice, either you pay with your data or with your money. You have to pay something because it's commercial things. So the question is, how much would people be willing to pay per month? For instance, if you have a Netflix subscription, you may pay 10 pounds or more per month. And so I give you the answer. Germans who are known to be concerned about privacy 75% of Germans are not willing to pay a single euro. They pay nothing, 75%. That's the privacy paradox. And yet it's hypothetical because the thing that will yeah. worry many of us is we aren't given that choice. Mm -hmm. we, we go on to every website we want to have access to. And in order to get access, we're asked to accept all cookies and we, you know, yeah. I I'm sure many people we we accept because we want to get on to the website and do our shopping or, or right. go to our email. So yeah. we don't have any uh, agency in that. Right. And um, that's true. Although you could go on, you can go off of social media. You can go on other social media. And I uh, see the problem. But you have a government that could step in. And I've made a simple calculation how much it would cost everyone to, so that Facebook now Meta would get a totally 100% reimbursed for what they get uh, in revenues from the advertisers. And the, the result is about two pounds a month. Two pounds a month is like a, cup of tea and that would give back that have, would have immense consequences because it's not just uh, the question is what is done with your data the, the data is going mostly to advertisers and the search algorithms are made in order to serve the, the advertisers not you because you are not the customer on Facebook it's the advertisers who are the customer you, your time and your attention is the product that's being sold. So all this extra information that Facebook 
and others collect. For instance, whether a person is pregnant, whether a person is depressed, uh, what the emotions are that are used in order to find the right moment to place an ad, huh? that would no longer be uh, needed to be collected. And that would just be for two euros. So this is an example of what we could do and solve a problem. And also many people who are get slightly addicted to, to their apps. Uh, for instance, uh, some of my best students and postdocs are working for social media companies in order to find out uh, how to keep people longer on the app. All that would be no longer made, needed and I could do something more useful. Let's um, focus on that then actually how people are being kept longer on their apps because if we know about what it is then we can hopefully um, you know maintain some control over it, it, it through the clarity and understanding. I mean for example one of the things that keeps us constantly checking you identify is likes and the like button yeah. on our smartphones. Yeah. So how, how does an awareness of how that works help us to um, sort of regain some control? So a general way to understand uh, what the business model is yeah, is the following. Imagine a free coffee house or tea house and where you get coffee for free. So everyone goes there and all the other coffee houses get bankrupt. So you have no choice anymore but to go there to meet your friends. But you enjoy your hours. But at the same time, there are bugs and cameras that monitor everything you say with whom. And also there are, are in the room, there are salesmen who try to sell you personalized products that made for you, for your desires, yeah? and interrupt you all the time. And in that coffee, in the free coffee house, the salesmen are the customers, it's not you. Your time, your attention is the product. That's roughly how Facebook, Instagram, and other social media work. And what we need is, we want a real coffee house where we pay, where we allow to be paid and not be the product. And then uh, all the rest that follows from that would not be necessary. For instance, one of the reasons why people find it hard to get off uh, an app, that could be Instagram. Uh, and uh, there's a study uh, in the UK, the, uh, the majority of teenagers complain that they can't get off. Hmm. So that you spend it. And the reason is called intermittent reinforcement. So that has to do with likes. Hmm. And also that the likes don't come in a package, but they can come anytime. So you need to check all the time whether they are one. Hmm. And uh, that is the, the psychologist B.F. Skinner had shown this with uh, pigeons that if you have an, an reinforcement plan that is intermittent, where you never know when you get a like or a pigeon, uh, a pellet, then they keep, the pigeons keep pecking all the time. Or another uh, way to understand that. So in the good old times, when you got mail, the mail person may have arrived at noon and you were eagerly waiting and watching, is it here or not yet? But then after you got it, you had 24 hours relaxed time. And what's happening uh, now is that the mail is coming in at any time, randomly, and people then watch all the time and cannot stop. That's the danger. Many can control it, but particular, but others are vulnerable. And we could change that. We could change this psychology mechanisms and create a better world. The original internet 
was meant to be one of uh, free information where uh, people have access to it. And even the founders of Google, Page and Brin, wrote against advertisement based search machines. But then the dot com crisis came and pressure uh, from uh, the people who gave them money and they turned 180 degrees and created an advertisement page. That's the original sin of the internet. And we don't need it. We could enjoy it. How could we get back to that to that first intention? It feels we're too far in now. Yeah, we are in now. And uh, we, uh, I think the only way is to have strong governments who put the feet down, who bite, are willing to bite. And, uh, and make it sure that uh, Facebook and Google get as much money as they get from advertisement, but just have this, uh, that this control is no longer not necessary. That we can sleep and relax. Um, that's absolutely fascinating. So much to, to ask you, as I said, and um, I must shortly come to questions from the audience, but um, a great deal more uh, to, to ask. And I, I think that one of the things um, that is very important that we're wary of and why human intelligence you know, must be seen as superior is the innate bias that comes with um, AI and algorithms, both gender bias um, and race, yeah. racial biases. Um, that they're ingrained because um, algorithms take use past data. Yeah. I don't see how we overcome that. Yeah. Uh, so the it, one needs to make clear that an algorithm is never better than the data. And if you worry about discrimination of women or discrimination color, and you have past data where this discrimination is in, you will just transport it in the future. So in this situation, an algorithm prevents changes. And also in order to be effective for an algorithm to be accurate, uh, it's often better than they discriminate heavily. I explained this in the book, how is it working and so um, it is it is very clear that we need to uh, uh, need to blindly think that algorithms are objective no no they, they can suffer from discrimination just like we uh, so uh, and human intelligence has I mean we have in 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 the last 50 years, the, the position of women in our society has changed so much to the better without any algorithms, with just human, uh, yeah, human dignity and, and thoughtfulness. And uh, so algorithms can do a few things, but they cannot do everything. And, and there's so much marketing hype and also techno religious faith that there would be at some point something like God, the so-called super intelligence. And then we are back on the uh, techno, religious, autocratic kind of uh, politics that I applied. So in many ways, we have to be wary that algorithms take us backwards, not forwards. Yeah, and important is not to put blame on algorithms but it's the people behind the algorithm, right. the organizations behind the algorithm who are there. We are always made to think it's about algorithms. It's not about algorithms. It is, it is uh, the, the, the development of AI is mainly commercial and military. That's what it is. And the hope that's being scientific, yeah, that is the original hope that is maybe number three. It's, it's fascinating, alarming, but we mustn't get alarmed, um, you know, in equal measure. And I'm going to just ask about a very important point that is about sort of democracy. A lot of this book um, feels profoundly relevant in the last couple of weeks, where we're, a lot of people feel a deep sense of, of worry about what's happening to sort of liberal democracy. And 
you, you write in your introduction that digital technology can easily tilt the scales towards autocratic yeah. systems. So how can you know we ensure that doesn't happen, or can we you know can democracies thrive in a digital age? I suppose is the question, and be preserved. Yeah. <clears throat> it can, yeah, but we are also sleepwalking into surveillance just for convenience and because we don't want to pay uh, such things. So, so I've written the book to, uh, to open their eyes and also that people go on the streets and vote uh, in order so that the internet will be a place where we can live without being surveilled, without being measured, monitored all the time. And, uh, and that's certainly possible and it was the original thing. And also part of this is to help people to understand how, um, uh, what websites are trustworthy and how to judge that. For instance, um, we think that digital natives would be able to tell facts from fake news, even better than adults, but neither is the case. So the studies show that more than 90% of digital natives don't know how to tell facts from fake news. And also one study shows that 96% from over 3000 students in California, digital natives do not know how to check the trustworthiness of a site. So they don't know the simplest techniques. They read a site like you read a piece of paper from the top down. And in the digital world, you have these possibilities and to do something else to do background checks. That's called lateral reading. So it goes like that. You read a site, get out, read only part hmm, for maybe a few seconds. You know what's it about. And then you go out of the site and find out something about, about them, where is behind the website. So there's a number of technologies which we all can learn. Lateral reading, not vertical reading or click constraint. Don't click at the first result. It's unlikely that it's the best for you, but read the snippets and be more reflective on the internet. So a lot of this is about critical thinking um, sort of self-awareness and you, do you feel this is something all of us can cultivate for ourselves or do you think it should be something that's you know taught uh, in, in yeah. <clears throat> yes uh, one can cultivate uh, it for oneself yes <laughs> but it should be systematically taught in schools and universities and i don't see it happening so many countries invest millions in technology whiteboards uh, tablets in schools but almost nobody invests anything into making uh, teenagers smart in terms of digital literate. So for instance, these kind of techniques are not known to most teenagers as the studies have shown. And the awareness that we, we need, yes, we need good technology. And much what we have is extra smartphone is a miracle, but it's not enough. We need also people who can control the technology, who understand it, and who uh, have, uh, for instance, self-control and don't um, yeah, a text while driving, just because they need to know what is the next a photo of a cat or as a menu that I'm being sent. And uh, so distracted drivers by now make about 10% of all deadly accidents. And that could be easily avoided. So the channel, my idea is that we need to make people strong, not just invest in algorithms. Mm -hmm. 